Welcome to this webinar organized by UK LFI Charitable Trust on the IHRA definition, origins, nature and impact. I'm Mark Polonsky, and it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Erwin Kotler, one of the leading experts in anti-Semitism. Professor Kotler is the founder and chair of the Raoul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights and Canada's special envoy on preserving Holocaust remembrance and combating anti-Semitism. He's a former Minister of Justice and Attorney General of Canada and a longtime member of Parliament. Uh, he's an Emeritus Professor of Law at McGill University and uh, well known for his work as an international human rights lawyer and uh, counsel to prisoners of conscience. Furthermore, he was a member of the original drafting committee of what became the IHRA definition. So who better than Professor Kotler to clarify for us the issues. Professor Kotler will speak for 25 minutes or half an hour, and then there'll be an opportunity for questions and answers. Uh, so I'd ask you please to uh, put your questions into the Q&A uh, so that I can uh, gather them and put them to him. Professor Kotler. <clears throat> Thank you, Mark, for those very kind, overly generous words of, of introduction. And may I begin by uh, thanking you, uh, uh, Jonathan Carolyn Turner, for organizing uh, yet another uh, timely and significant forum. I'm one of those who seeks to try and uh, attend all your forums because I am the beneficiary uh, of the expertise that you share with so many. We meet today at an important moment of remembrance and reminder. On the eve of the 80th anniversary, the operationalizing of the death camps of, at the time, Treblinka and Sobibor. In other words, the operationalizing of what a few months earlier was the Wansi Declaration and its blueprint for the final solution to the Jewish people. Just as we meet in the aftermath, of the 77th anniversary marking the liberation of the death camp Auschwitz, the most brutal extermination camp of the 20th century, a laboratory of mass murder for which there are no graves. 1.3 million people were deported to the death camp Auschwitz. 1.1 million of them were Jews. Let there be no mistake about it. Jews were murdered at Auschwitz because of anti-Semitism. But anti-Semitism itself did not die at Auschwitz. It remains the bloodied canary in the mineshaft of global evil today. Toxic to democracies, as Dr. Ahmed Shahid has put it, an assault on our common humanity. And as we've learned only too painfully and too well, and which bears repetition yet again, that while it begins with Jews, it doesn't end with Jews. Indeed, as we meet, we are witnessing an old new escalating, intensifying, global, virulent, and lethal anti-Semitism, grounded in classical anti-Semitism, but distinguishable from it, that first found international, institutional, juridical expression in the United Nations Zionism as Racism Resolution, which at the time, US Ambassador to the UN, Daniel Moynihan referred to it as giving the abomination of anti-Semitism the appearance of international legal sanction. But it has gone dramatically beyond that. A old new anti-Semitism for which we almost need a new vocabulary to define it, and which I will reference Ira as being that framing vocabulary in that sense, and which can best be understood by looking at it through a human rights lens, an equality rights lens, something which I shared with the participants at the first Stockholm conference on the Holocaust in the year 2000, which led also to the establishment of IRA and in turn to the adoption of the definition. As I said then, and bears, I think, referencing today, that traditional or classical anti-Semitism is a discrimination against, denial of, assault upon the rights of 
Jews to live as equal members in whatever society they inhabit. The new anti-Semitism is a discrimination against, denial of, assault upon the rights of Israel and the Jewish people to live as an equal member of the family of nations, at times even the right even to live. What is common to both forms of anti-Semitism, traditional and new, is discrimination. All that has happened is that has moved from discrimination against Jews as individuals to discrimination against the Jews as a people, and then reverberating back to discrimination against Jews as individuals. Indeed, this initial framing of human rights as a looking glass into anti-Semitism as the oldest, longest, most enduring, and most dangerous of hatreds also reminds us of anti-Semitism as a virus that mutates and metastasizes over time, but is grounded in one generic foundational historical trope. And that is Jews, the Jewish people, and then Israel as the enemy of all that is good and the embodiment of all that is evil. Reflective and representative of whatever is the zeitgeist at any given moment. So when Christianity was the zeitgeist, the canon for the good, then the Jews were guilty of deicide. When we had the black plagues, then Jews were the poisoners of the wells and the enemy of all that is good and embodiment of all that is evil. And where for the last now I would say 50 years, where human rights has emerged as the new secular religion of our time. Then the Jewish people, Israel, are held out as a new meta human rights violator of our time, as the new geopolitical antichrist of our time, as it were. Let me give you a snapshot from 1974 the year before the adoption of the Zionism is racism resolution, which went almost unnoticed and unacknowledged at the time. And so it was then in 1974 that Israel was held out to be the enemy of labor. Evidence, the resolution of the International Labor Organization condemning Israeli suppression of Palestinian trade unionism. The enemy of health, evidence, the resolution of the World Health Organization condemning at the time alleged, I use the word alleged, but the finding was different, Israeli poisonings of Palestinians on the West Bank. And may I just add parenthetically, but not unimportantly, that last year, Israel was held out to be the only violator of health rights in the world. The enemy of culture evidence, the resolution of UNESCO condemning Israeli desecration of historic sites in the West Bank and Jerusalem. The enemy of women, evidence, the resolution of the UN Commission on the Status of Women, condemning Israeli suppression of Palestinian women rights. And again, a year ago, Israel held out to be the only violator of women's rights in the world. The enemy of peace, evidence, the resolution of the UN General Assembly, condemning Israel as a non-peace-loving nation. And the enemy of human rights, Evidence, the resolution of the then UN Commission on Human Rights, now the UN Council on Human Rights, singling out, in fact, Israel for selective uh, opprobrium and indictment. And so it is that Israel as the enemy of labor, health, culture, women, peace, and human rights, Israel was held out to be the enemy of all that was good and reflectively the embodiment of all that is evil. This process of delegitimization, demonization, double standards, and the like has regrettably been proceeding incrementally, indulgently, <clears throat> almost imperceptibly for close to 50 years. And where effectively anti Semitism is laundered under the protective cover of the UN, under the authority of international law under the culture of human rights, under the very struggle against racism itself, as I'll show in a few moments. A process 
which reached a tipping point in the World Conference Against Racism in Durban, South Africa, an important precursor to the understanding of the process for the adoption of the IRA working definition on anti-Semitism. When I first heard in 1997 as a law professor then, that there was going to be a world conference against racism in Durban, South Africa in 2001, I greeted this news with anticipation, if not excitement. This was going to be the first anti-racism conference of the 21st century. It was going to be, in fact, the first international human rights conference of the 21st century. And it was to take place in Durban, South Africa, the birthplace of South African apartheid. And as someone who had been arrested, in fact, as part of the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa in 1981, I was looking forward to returning uh, to South Africa, this time now as a member of the uh, Canadian delegation to the Durban conference. But what happened at Durban, to use an oft abused metaphor, was truly Orwellian. A world conference against racism and hate turned into a conference of racism and hate against Israel and the Jewish people. A world conference for the promotion and protection of human rights tender, turned into a conference singling out one member state, in this instance, Israel, one people, in this instance, the Jewish people, for selective opprobrium and indictment. A conference to commemorate the dismantling of South African apartheid turned into a conference calling for the dismantling of Israel as an apartheid state. As one, as I mentioned, who participated in the Durban uh, conference, I can tell you that Durban has indelibly imprinted itself not only on my memory, but on my being. I can still, as I meet with you now, I can still hear the chants. I can still see the placards. I can still hear the demonstrators saying that the struggle against apartheid in the 20th century required the dismantling of South Africa as an apartheid state and the struggle against apartheid in the 21st century requires the dismantling of Israel as an apartheid state. The Amnesty International report did not start in 2021 or 2022. The report was then in fact beginning in the aftermath of Durban. I also can still see as I meet with you, the placards, the posters saying that too bad that Hitler didn't finish the job, comparing Israel to the Nazis. In fact, before the Durban conference, and it's oft forgotten, there were four regional conferences in the run-up to the World Conference Against uh, <coughs> Racism in Durban. The last of the four took place in Tehran, in Iran. And that brought forth as a blueprint for the World Conference Against Racism and its consideration, and which metastasized itself in, in the form, the notion of Israel as a crime against humanity, of Israel as an apartheid state, of Israel as systematically engaging in the worst of war crimes and crimes against humanity. I can go on. It was one of the most scurrilous indictments of any state since the end of the Second World War. And it found its expression in Durban, in the travaux préparatoires, the preparatory documents of Durban. I flew back from Durban to Montreal on September 10th. I woke up as we all did in the morning of September 11th to 9-11. And Durban, which became the launching pad for the metastasizing and mutating of anti-Semitism these past 20 years, in effect launched the notion of Israel as an apartheid state, as I mentioned, at Durban itself. Indeed, in the immediate aftermath of Durban, Jews were blamed for 
the meeting of the UN Human Rights Commission taking place after Durban singled out one particular state, Israel, for the majority of condemnations while giving the major human rights violators exculpatory immunity. The cry of Durban with respect to Israel being an apartheid state found expression in a meeting at the University of Michigan in the aftermath of Durban, where a resolution proposing the recognition of a two-state solution if Israel were to become a democratic state itself problematic was defeated in favor of a resolution calling for the dismantling of Israel as an apartheid state and the launching of the BDS movement. And perhaps most egregious of all, and has gone utterly unnoticed, was the fact that the contracting parties to the Geneva Convention of 1949, Corpus of International Humanitarian Law, met for the first time in 52 years in the immediate aftermath of the Durban Conference to put one state in the docket. It was not Syria, it was not Iran, it was not Russia, the only country put into the docket of the accused and condemned for violations of international humanitarian law at the first ever gathering of the contracting parties to the Geneva Convention was Israel. And I might add, again, parenthetically, but not unimportantly, that the contracting parties to the Geneva Convention have met twice since then. And the only state put into the docket of the accused, again, was Israel. Durban then became a tipping point, a launching pad for the intensification and internationalization of anti-Semitism as being in effect and held out to be an assault on all on our common humanity. But in a true Orwellian form, it was laundered in the name of our common humanity under the rubric of the UN International Humanitarian Law, culture of human rights, indeed under the very cover of the struggle against racism itself. Let me just mention one caveat, uh, which under, underpins also all my remarks. None of what I've said thus far and will intend to continue, but none of this is intended to suggest that Israel is somehow above the law or that uh, Israel and the Jewish people are to have some form of privilege or preference before the law because of the horrors of history and the Holocaust. Not at all. Israel, like any other state, is accountable for any violations of international human rights and humanitarian law. But that's the point. No one should seek, nor does Israel seek, for it to be above the law. The problem is that Israel is being systematically denied equality before the law in the international arena. Not that Israel should respect human rights, which she must, but that the rights of Israel deserve equal respect. Not that human rights standards should not be applied to Israel. They must be. But these standards must be applied equally to everyone else. And what one witnessed as well in the aftermath of Durban, and I'm going to just very almost summarize this in a series of one-liners, because all this presaged the drafting and the coming into being of the IRA working definition. The first was the phenomenon of genocidal anti-Semitism. This is not a word that I use lightly or easily. I'm actually taking the definition right out of the genocide convention, which not only seeks to prevent and protect against acts of genocide, but characterizes incitement to genocide as itself a violation of the genocide convention. And it is oft forgotten, if it was at all even known, that the 20th, 21st century began on January 3rd with the Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khamenei of Iran saying there could be no resolution to the Arab-Israeli conflict without the annihilation of the Jewish state, not even using the euphemism 
so often used of the Zionist regime, a form of incitement and breach of the genocide convention that has continued and been referenced ever since in the incitement of the elimination of Israel as a cancerous tumor itself. But it has gone beyond that. Not only has there been state sanctioned incitement to hatred and to the genocide of Israel and the Jewish people, but this has been accompanied by, again, in this Orwellian false accusation in the mirror of condemning Israel itself as being a genocidal state. The second is the indictment of Israel as an apartheid state. Now, I think we appreciate that one of the worst things uh, you can do in this world with respect to any particular state, also to an Israel, is to label them as being racist. The very label supplies the indictment. Often no further proof is required. But if any further proof is required, then you refer to Israel as not only a racist state, but an apartheid state. Because apartheid is defined in international law as a crime against humanity. If you say that Israel is an apartheid state, then you're saying that it's a crime against humanity. If it's a crime against humanity, then it has no right to be. On the contrary, we as trustees of international law, so to speak, have a responsibility to ensure that this apartheid state has no right to be. And that's what underpins also the Amnesty International Report. The third is the phenomenon and an extension of this, of what I would call ideological or demonological anti-Semitism. That was already present at Durban and of course has metastasized since. This is the reference uh, to Israel as a racist, imperialist, colonialist, ethnic cleansing, child murdering, apartheid settler, Nazi state. All the demonological epithets for the presumptive indictment of Israel as the most criminal apartheid state that we have. The fourth is political anti-Semitism. By that, I'm referring to four components very quickly in one-liners, the denial of Israel's legitimacy, if not its right to exist, the denial of the Jewish people's right to self-determination, if not the right even that the Jewish people are to be considered a people. All these things find expression, as you know, in the uh, illustrative examples in the IRA working definition. The fifth is the phenomenon of terrorist anti-Semitism. And in fact, what preceded the actual drafting of the IRA working definition was the worst spate of anti-Jewish terrorism that took place in what has been called the second intifada. That to me is itself a sanitizing uh, term and where the brutal murder on the occasion of the Passover Seder in Netanya in March 19, in March 2002, is message and metaphor for this terrorist anti-Semitism. And finally, as I mentioned, the laundering of anti-Semitism under the <coughs> authority of international law, the protective cover of the UN, the culture of human rights, the struggle against racism. And so, and this is not as well known as it de deserves to be, that this Durban as a launching pad for all that I've just uh, referenced, became in effect the catalyst for the drafting of the IRA working definition on anti-Semitism. When we gathered at the Stockholm conference in 2002, as I said, the founding conference which established IRA was in 2000, <clears throat> second one was in 2001. When we came in the aftermath of Durban, we met together at the time, former Nobel Peace Laureate Eloise El, Zikronoli Vracha, the former Deputy Prime Minister of Sweden, Per Almark, and myself, under also the auspices of the then Prime Minister of Sweden, a Joran a person. And we set to draft what would be the metrics for an IRA working definition on anti Semitism. You see, we had metrics for classical anti Semitism. The Anti Defamation League had been doing annual audits with regard to a series of some 11 metrics, you know, <clears throat> do Jews control the media, et cetera, et cetera. But there had been no metrics 
with respect to the new anti-Semitism, with respect not only to those dimensions of classical anti-Semitism, but with respect to uh, Israel as the uh, Jew among other nations. And that's what we set the draft. And let me now uh, frame for you the components that underpin the IRA working definition as we drafted it and as it developed over time. The first thing is that the IRA working definition was not invented out of whole cloth. That the IRA working definition, which has emerged as the most authoritative, comprehensive, and international consensus definition that we have, is also the most representative. It was a resolution that was adopted over a 15 year decision making process. And I was, as I say, present at the creation, but partook of the process, which I will share with you as well as we go through it. A decision making process involving the adoption of this definition serially by intergovernmental bodies like the European uh, Monitoring Center for the Combating of Racism and uh, Xenophobia, by parliamentary uh, bodies such as the Interparliamentary Coalition to Combat Anti-Semitism, which Lord John Mann and myself founded in 2008, by civil society leaders, by now the member states of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, so we're now talking there about 35 states there, by the European Commission, by the Council of Europe, by the European Union, by civil society leaders, by, scholar, by scholars, academic institutes, and the like. And the Cantor Center at Tel Aviv University has mapped this uh, adoption over time, as I said, of this most representative working definition on anti-Semitism. Secondly, what is also not well known, though I've been referencing it, is the human rights underpinning of the adoption of this definition. Indeed, I can tell you as someone who was then working on it, uh, first as a member of parliament and then as a minister of justice and attorney general of Canada, that the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, one of the most comprehensive rights charters that we have, itself served as a drafting framework for that which became the illustrative examples in the IRA working uh, definition, and which is anchored in the equality rights uh, principle of equal treatment of the law, of equal protection of the law. And where anti-Semitism was seen to be as a fundamental assault on our fundamental freedoms, our freedoms of conscience and religion, our freedoms of thought, opinion, belief and expression of our right to life, liberty and security of the person. All these generic fundamental freedoms set forth in the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which were used as part of a drafting framework for that purpose. The third is that IRA was seen as a framework for the protection of these rights. And so when you hear that IRA working definition on anti-Semitism suppresses speech. It's the other way around. The whole purpose here was to protect the speech of those, for example, particularly in the campus culture students who are being maligned, bullied, excluded from participation in the campus culture, who are being forced to choose, if you will, between their Jewish identity and acceptance into the progressive campus uh, culture and the like. The fourth thing is that IRA was protective also of criticism of Israel. So the notion that it not only silences speech, but silences criticism, here too, it's the other way around. It expressly states that criticism of Israel is not anti-Semitism, as long as that criticism does not go beyond the lines of singling out Israel for selective uh, opprobrium. Number uh, five here, an important uh, process and set of uh, 
principles and antecedents not always appreciated is that there were important parliamentary principles and an antecedents of adoption. I referred to the London Declaration on Combating Antisemitism adopted at the Interparliamentary Conference in London in 2009, to the founding conference for the Interparliamentary Coalition. The Ottawa Conference uh, that took place in Ottawa and drafted the Ottawa Parliamentary Protocol. I might add, if you read the London Declaration or you read the Ottawa Parliamentary Protocol, you will see the exact language that became part of the IRA working definition in 2016. In other words, there were already parliamentary principles and antecedents engaged in the framing and the adoption of the IRA working uh, definition. And finally, uh, or maybe second, IRA also is anchored in our international treaty obligations. In other words, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights prohibits incitement to discrimination, hostility, and violence. And that also underpinned our work. And the final point is, IRA is a non-binding working definition. It is in effect to be used as a resource, as a guide, as an asset. In other words, if you can't identify or recognize anti-Semitism, if you can't define it, then you will not be able to effectively monitor it and effectively combat it. And that's why it is a useful guideline. And indeed, I would say a, an exceptional resource for use by governments, parliaments, universities, law enforcement authorities, social media platforms, and the like. In other words, it is anchored in equality rights, is intended to be protective of our fundamental uh, human rights. It is intended to guard against discrimination, whether of the classical kind or of the new. May I close just with one other reference? And that is, I mentioned Durban as a tipping point. We witnessed recently a second tipping point, and that was uh, the Hamas war in Israel in May 2021. I mentioned that because what occurred in Canada occurred elsewhere, where Jews were threatened and targeted in their neighborhoods and on the streets, on the campuses and in their communities, where Holocaust memorials were defaced, where synagogues were torched, where cemeteries were desecrated, where Jewish institutions were vandalized, all of which found expression in two empirical in this year that found expression in Europe. Namely, by May 2021 in Canada, we had reached the highest level of hate crimes ever in Canadian history. 2020 had been the highest level. We had reached it by 2021. And in the United Kingdom, you recently found that 2021 had the highest level of anti-Semitic incidences ever. And again, uh, the Hamas war is identified as, as being a particular catalyst there. And France has had a 75% increase and a particular increase in violent assaults in the like. In other words, Hamas war became a tipping point. And we found this also in the incendiary explosion of hate on the social media, on, on the internet, where, uh, for example, not only did you have in one week in May 2021, 17,000 tweets that Hitler was right. But as a recent study has shown, 84% of the anti-Semitism and the posting on the internet is not uh, removed. And so I close with these reminders, which make the IRA working definition so important. And it's the convergence of the following. Number one, that while we speak of combating anti-Semitism from the far right, and the far left and radical Islam, that conventional paradigm, while true, is not sufficient. What we are increasingly witnessing is the mainstreaming, the normalizing, the legitimation of anti-Semitism in the political culture, the absence of outrage underpinned by indifference and inaction, which makes the IRA working definition so important. Second, the globalization of anti-Semitism, the need therefore for an international definition what we found here, for example, 
in May 2021 that what happened in London and Paris was replicated in Montreal and Toronto. So a convoy that went through the streets of London saying, F the Jews will rape your daughters, a similar convoy then went through the streets of Toronto. The third, and this is something that I found in my work as special envoy in my first year, is the laundry of anti-Semitism under the very cover of anti-racism itself. And so students in the campus culture are held out to be part of the privileged white, if not supremacist class and apologists for the white supremacist state of Israel in, in the Middle East, caught therefore in a pincer movement in this kind of discriminatory uh, stereotyping. And I found something else, that the struggle against racism in Canada, which is something that we all seek to in, endorse and partake of, whether it be systemic racism against indigenous people, blacks and people of color, a Muslim, Asian Canadians and the like. What I found is that anti-Semitism was marginalized, if not excluded in the education and training with respect to the overall combating of racism itself. Yet another raison d'etre for the invocation, application, implementation of the IRA working definition. It's one thing to adopt it as the government of Canada has done as our two major provinces, Quebec and Ontario. It's another to implement it as an operational, a working definition that can serve as an identifier, as a monitor, and thereby help underpin the combating of anti-Semitism. And as we must always remember that anti-Semitism cannot be fought, let alone can it be won by Jews alone. It is toxic to democracy. It is an assault on our common humanity. And we need to mobilize a global constituency of conscience to combat it in the name of our common humanity. Thank you. Great, thank you, Erwin, for that very stimulating uh, and inspiring talk. And uh, uh, there are a lot of questions that have been coming through. I'll do my best to uh, group them and summarize them. Uh, so one, one of the questions is about the effectiveness of the IHRA definition. Uh, how effective is it in practice? You've described so many uh, negative statements from various UN bodies which are going along in parallel with the IHRA definitions adoption. Uh, one one uh, question asked whether it would be more effective to have a general statement about anti-Semitism and a separate one dealing with Israel, uh, which could uh, address this. And uh, 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 another question it, it, it related is, uh, you mentioned the term non-binding, wouldn't it be more effective if this were binding, what is meant by non-binding, uh, uh, and linked to that also, what about the alternative definitions uh, that have emerged, or the, 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 like the Jerusalem Declaration, what is your uh, view of those and how best to respond? So, um... On, on the first, in the matter of the reference, uh, maybe divide uh, anti-Semitism re Jews and anti-Semitism uh, re Israel, I think they are inextricably bound up uh, one uh, with the other. I think the case study of uh, the Hamas war, while it was a, uh, a war against Israel, it found expression as I shared in terms of the targeting of Jews wherever they were uh, as almost being uh, proxies and that too was a uh, violation of the IRA working uh, definition. I think the, we, we have there in the 11 uh, examples, uh, examples that relate to classical anti-Semitism, uh, Jews alone, uh, that relate to uh, Israel as I would call the targeted collective Jew among the nations and the interrelationship. So I think um, it's best to work with a generic uh, foundational and interrelated definition that we have. I think it's important to appreciate also that the IRA definition was not invented out of whole cloth. It was, as I said, the result of a democratic decision-making uh, process that began uh, really uh, with the actual establishment of uh, IRA itself, uh, and then uh, through some 15 years of adoption 
uh, by intergovernmental bodies, governments, parliaments, uh, and the like was finally unanimously adopted by IRA in 2016 and uh, since then been adopted by uh, more bodies and the like. And I think while the UK is not a part of the, uh, uh, at this point, uh, the EU, uh, the UK is the gold standard with respect to the adoption of IRA in terms of the, uh, and I want to commend uh, Lord John Mann for his uh, work here because uh, he has singularly uh, been responsible for the adoption uh, of IRA by all the sports clubs. And this reaches millions of, 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 of people, and participants and the like, and also the universities that have uh, adopted it, including the flagship universities of Oxford, Cambridge, and uh, the like. So I think it's important to stay with uh, the definition that we have, and that leads to the, about the non-binding thing. It doesn't mean that you cannot reference the IRA definition in uh, state law. What it means is that uh, it itself is to be held out as being an educative guide, resource, asset, tool, and the like, as I said, in my view, an indispensable uh, resource. Uh, some of the criticism of it by those who are unaware of it are that they see it as being binding and uh, obligatory. And no, it's not. It's, uh, but it can allow for, uh, example, the training of law enforcement authorities in the application of the IRA definition. Let me just give one example. I mean, I can give many. But recently we had the attack on the uh, synagogue in Colville, Texas, uh, by a uh, jihadist who came from the UK to the States uh, to seek to take hostages in a synagogue, engaged himself in anti-Semitic uh, tropes that he believed that uh, though, uh, Jews had the power to free uh, another jihadist uh, that was imprisoned close uh, to that synagogue. So here we had a jihadist targeting Jews in a synagogue, on the Sabbath, using anti-Semitic tropes and the like. And yet the first utterance by an FBI agent was that this was a random attack unrelated uh, to the Jewish community, something repeated also by the Associated Press and the like. So I think the importance and thereafter, when it was revisited also through the lens of IRA, uh, then it was characterized as being an anti Semitic hate crime, indeed a anti-Semitic terrorist hate crime. And so I'm using that as one example, but, but there are many um, uh, where IRA is indispensable for the training of law enforcement authorities for use by social media platforms when we have the incendiary hate in the uh, social media and they need uh, guidelines uh, as well. And with respect to other definitions, well, the, the point is, uh, this definition, as I said, has been the product of a international and governmental and parliamentary and scholarly and civil society democratic decision-making process over 15 years. I don't know any other definition uh, that can, in fact, uh, compete with it from the point of view of the democratic process of adoption and the representational character of the definition. It's not to say that you know one should just dismiss any other definition. I'm just saying that uh, if you look at the IRA working uh, definition, then it is the most representative, inclusive, uh, egalitarian, uh, and one that is anchored, and I think this is something that keeps getting forgotten. It is anchored in a human rights lens. It is anchored in an equality rights lens. It is anchored in our international treaty obligations. Uh, it is anchored really in the whole process of understanding, if you will, what traditional and uh, contemporary anti-Semitism, how they interrelate of the Holocaust as a paradigm for radical evil, of anti-Semitism as a paradigm for radical hate, that's what IRA was born of, and that's why it is so natural that this 
working definition is in fact the result of IRA's democratic decision-making over time. Thank you. Uh, there have been a number of questions about the issue of freedom of expression. Uh, one of the objections, as you know, uh, it, it, that, that's been put forward, particularly in the university context, is that this stifles debate. Uh, and uh, that the, some questioners have asked, what about the efforts on campus to uh, object to uh, the I adoption of the IHRA definition? How should that be dealt with? Indeed, uh, one questioner, uh, posits that uh, wonders what you think of the, the idea that any opposition to uh, adoption of the IHRA definition is is itself evidence of anti-Semitism, or are there good faith reasons that uh, that that could be done? Well, first thing I always say that we should be careful in not using the label of anti-Semitism uh, too easily. Um, in other words, if we start saying that everything is anti-Semitic, then nothing is anti-Semitic. We have to guard against um, another uh, dimension that I've often found concerning, and I've written about it with respect to, to Ira. didn't want to take more time to go into the, the danger of the weaponization of uh, anti-Semitism or the politicization of it, where uh, a political party calls out anti-Semitism in the others. Uh, party, but not in their own. Uh, we have to have a zero tolerance policy for anti-Semitism. We have to hold our own accountable and not just uh, the other, the other political party, whatever, as being uh, accountable. And in that context, uh, I don't regard uh, opposition uh, to anti-Semitic, to the IRA working definition as being uh, in and of itself anti-Semitic. Some of that opposition may be born out of uh, ignorance, it may be born out of misinformation, and we live in a world where there is a good deal of misinformation and disinformation. So I think one of our responsibilities is to educate about the IRA working uh, definition. I find even people who uh, uh, invoke it, or in fact, who've been involved in uh, enacting it or adopting it, are themselves not entirely uh, well-versed in the manner in which it is underpinned, as Dr. Ahmed Shahid has put it, by a human rights lens, by human rights principles and policies. And the European Commission has put out a very good manual with respect to uh, you know, good practices regarding the use and application of the IRA definition. And I would recommend that, that manual you know, for our use as well. So I think we need to educate about uh, the IRA working uh, definition. Uh, we can engage in, you know, in discussions about it. And that's why I, I certainly would not dismiss somebody who opposes it as being anti-Semitic. That doesn't mean that there are not people who uh, oppose it out of reasons of anti-Semitism and who know very well what they are doing. But as I say, we have to begin with a good faith approach and not assume that that which needs to be known about IRA is known, and that IRA is really part of uh, our collective uh, reservoir for combating, you know, racism, hate, discrimination, and anti-Semitism. And, and and thank you, Aaron. And what about the 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 issue of freedom of of expression on on campus? Yes. Well, uh, again. Uh, I, there was a, an issue recently where the University of Toronto, for example, uh, had a working group with regard to anti-Semitism because there have been uh, outbursts there in uh, Toronto. I had a, an opportunity to address the Temelty Faculty of Medicine because of the allegations uh, of anti-Semitism there and the lived experience of, of students who were testifying uh, to uh, being the targets and victims of anti-Semitism. The University of Toronto recently took a decision to not adopt the IRA working definition on anti-Semitism, although they put forth a whole series of recommendations as to how they would combat it. But if one reads their report about why they took that decision, and as I said, they are free to make that decision, 
their rationale for taking it uh, was unscholarly, unacademic, uh, did not base itself really on a real understanding of the history, uh, the facts, uh, the nature, etc., of the IRA working definition. So again, I, I think uh, for in the campus culture, people should see the IRA working definition as being protective, as I said, of speech, of being protective of criticism of Israel and advocacy for Palestinian rights, of being protective of the quality of uh, the campus uh, community, uh, be they students, uh, faculty, and the like, as being anchored in a human rights approach. What it says is basically that you can't single out a particular people, state, or members of that people or state for selective opprobrium and indictment. When you do that, you cross the line uh, and you, in that sense, begin to be in breach of principles of equality, freedom of speech, uh, human rights, and, and the like. So yes, uh, students uh, have to be protected in their speech. And that means all students in all their speech. It doesn't mean you can have free speech for those who want to criticize Israel, but no free speech for those who want to support Israel. That is a standing breach of the principle of equality before the law. Thanks. What one one um, question uh, relates to the uh, way uh, e expression can be anti-Semitic depending on the, the context, the speaker and the audience. Uh, there are a lot of jokes made by Jewish comedians to Jewish audiences that are uh, uh, in a different context and expressed by a different person could be characterized as anti-Semitic. Uh, how does one deal with that? Uh, and a related question is, yeah, is, it, 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 yeah was the uh, uh, wording of the IHRA definition in some ways also a compromise that ended up uh, minimizing uh, anti-Semitism or play, playing, playing it down? Yeah, both are very important uh, comments. Uh, the first, uh, the contextual principle uh, is something that is built into the uh, IRA working definition. In, in other words, just as uh, it speaks about uh, criticism of Israel not being anti-Semitic, it also speaks about making determinations whether uh, such speech is anti-Semitic by appreciating uh, the context in which uh, it took place. I might add that too was taken out of the uh, Canadian jurisprudence. The contextual principle is a foundational principle in Canadian uh, Supreme Court jurisprudence. And so th that related uh, to the background to that as well. And I'm glad that the questioner referenced the thing of context. I should have mentioned it in my opening remarks and I appreciate uh, that important uh, refinement that was made also about the interesting point uh, that Ira might understate uh, anti-Semitism. Well, look at it this way. We, when we approached it, we had other examples. Uh, for example, uh, we did not go into all the uh, dimensions that I shared now uh, with respect to what might be dem demonological anti-Semitism or even genocidal anti-Semitism or terrorist anti-Semitism. It is, uh, in fact, referenced more largely in the framing uh, of the examples. But an important point here is that the examples are intended to be illustrative, not exhaustive. And one can, as a basis, uh, on a basis of those examples, you know, extend to other similar uh, examples. And thereby, that's why the IRA working uh, definition in its uh, anchorage in human rights law, in equality rights law, in offering uh, examples, but uh, acknowledging that these examples are not themselves exhaustive, but illustrative. Uh, I think it's the principles behind them that allow us to be able to see how it can be used as a resource, as a guideline, uh, as an asset, as a framing uh, tool, and that's why the uh, 
uh, European Commission handbook on good practices is so helpful in that regard because it goes into each of the examples and gives um, um, examples in the IRA definition of, of illustrations of anti-Semitism and enlarges upon it. And I think um, your listeners will see there how uh, the IRA working definition is in effect a very representative and inclusive uh, principle and egalitarian. Thank you. Well, one question says that it's been quite damaging. One of the things that's been damaging or undermining of the IHRA definition is uh, the interventions by Kenneth Stern distancing himself from it or criticizing those who have adopted it. Uh, what do you think can be done in relation to that? And should should others involved in the drafting be stepping in to, uh, to uh, uh, dispute that? Well, I, I think um, Fathom has just put out a series of articles. Um, and I think one thing that is common by those who were there and have spoken about it, uh, for example, uh, there is a letter put out by uh, Rabbi Baker and others who were singularly involved in the drafting process um, that Kenneth Stern was not part of the uh, original and ongoing uh, drafting team. Again, this doesn't mean that he himself uh, does not have a contribution to make. Um, it doesn't mean that his contribution should not be uh, related to, by the way, he does accept the IRA working definition with regard to uh, its use and application in academe more than some people might appreciate. But uh, the fact that he has put in his byline that he was the original or principal drafter of the IRA definition, for those of us who were there, that's simply not the case. And while I respect whatever contribution he made as part of the hub of those who are engaged in this. Um, it has to be seen in the dimension in which it found expression uh, and not as one of the leaders or let alone the lead draftsman. Thanks. Um, we've really got just one more minute. So maybe a point of information. Uh, you've mentioned the uh, the handbook of the European Commission. Is that easily obtainable? I'm sure a lot of a lot of the audience will be wanting to follow up on that. Yes, it's it's easily obtainable, and it's uh, something that uh, Katharina von Schnurbein, who's the uh, EU special envoy for combating anti-Semitism and uh, <coughs> promoting uh, Jewish life, she herself references it very often in, in her work. Uh, so it's 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 easily obtainable. Uh, any of the European framework, uh, Council of Europe, EU, European Commission. Uh, can provide a copy. And I, I think the UK might want to consider developing their own manual. We in Canada are now developing a manual for the use of the IRA definition in Canada. Uh, it is uh, announced recently by the Canadian government that they want to do this. I've been asked to uh, put this into effect, but I think it would be a good model. And the UK, which, as I say, in my view, is the gold standard uh, for the implementation of the IRA working definition might want to put out its own manual and give expression to its own gold standard. Thank you, Aaron. Well, it's encouraging to hear your views of, of, of the UK's uh, approach and, uh, and also a very practical suggestion, which uh, we should uh, lobby for. Uh, thank you very much. Um, there are many more questions and we could have carried on for, for a lot longer, but you've, you've packed an enormous amount in to this last uh, hour and given us a, a, a great deal to think about and clarified many of the, uh, the issues. So uh, thank you very much on behalf of the very many uh, uh, attendees. Uh, and from uh, my side, on behalf of uh, UK LFI uh, Charitable Trust. I just wanted to uh, let uh, everyone know uh, the next uh, webinar is on the 20th of uh, March and it's Professor Rosa Friedman talking about very relevantly uh, UN human rights systems and how to engage with them. So thank you very much everyone uh, and uh, Professor Kotler, thanks, thanks to you. Thank you, and I'll be looking forward to joining you on March the 20th. You've got an excellent speaker and a timely topic.